Welcome to the Making Money in Multifamily show, where we discuss everything to do with multifamily real estate investing. We believe it's the best way to gain financial freedom and build lasting wealth. This is where you'll find the best information and practices to help you succeed in your real estate business, whether you're already experienced or just starting out. Here's your host, Dave Morja. Hello, listener, and welcome to this week's episode of Making Money in Multifamily. I am your host, Dave Morja, and today's guest is Rob Beardsley. Rob, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. Rob has purchased and invested in over $30 million of value-add multifamily real estate. He has underwritten more than 750 deals and has published over 40 articles about underwriting, fundamentals, capital structure and business plan formation, and real estate capital markets. Rob, thanks for coming on again. Glad to have you. Could you tell the listener a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing in the multifamily real estate space? Absolutely. I'm a principal at Lone Star Capital Group. Um, we're an emerging multifamily sponsor based out of New York. Uh, we're heavily focused on Texas, specifically Houston, with a deal sourcing all across the Smile States focused on Texas and the Southeast. Um, so, our, you know, your typical value add uh, multifamily outfit, we're a little bit different as we have a bit more of a focus on uh, heavier value add and, and deals that necessitate bridge loans. Um, and that's kind of, and there's some other ways that we try to differentiate ourselves. That's awesome. So you mentioned, um, you kind of look for, I, I wouldn't call it distressed properties, but you look for basically where there's more, uh, more fixes to be done type of deal or operationally, uh, fix it up. Um, is that kind of consistent with your last deal or would you like to go and explain like what you've been up to lately? Yeah. So I think, like you said, stress. Their distress is certainly something we're interested in and we would like to see more of it. But as you know, the market has been recovering for a very long time and there's a lot of liquidity and owners are uh, capable of maintaining their properties well. So there's very little distress out there and the prop, uh, the deals that are distressed are likely to be in locations that are just class D don't go there and it wouldn't make sense to go and, uh, you know, fix the property up anyway. Um, so while it's what we would really like, uh, in this market, we're really looking for risk adjusted returns anywhere along the risk spectrum. So we bought core plus deals, which really are a light value add and, uh, not much, not requiring much renovations. And, uh, we're also, uh, buying deals that are half vacant. Right. That's awesome. So you mentioned you're kind of trying to stay flexible as you you said it is kind of a harder market to dive into and i think that's even more reason to have the underwriting skills that you have because you need to be able to identify you know what's a fox and what's a hen type of situation um you might not know if it's a good deal or not so you got to kind of assume the right assumptions and make sure you're um fleshing out the property right operationally um what exactly when you're looking for a deal, what are kind of some of the quick wickets you try to hit just to be able to move forward past the initial underwriting phase? Yeah. So on the initial pass, obviously we're looking to hit our minimum return hurdle, uh, which again needs to be risk adjusted. So I, I can't just say I will, we need a 15% IRR because if the, the property's half vacant, I'm going to need a much higher return than that to ensure that I get a risk adjusted return, that there's a, uh, cushion of safety there. So on the on the low end, if it's a if it's a nice stabilized core plus deal, that would be something like a 15% IRR net of fees that what we're looking for. And on the higher risk spectrum for pursuing uh, deep value add or potentially distress, uh, that would be we would need uh, potentially 25% IRR. So I'd say in that window is is what we're looking for and. Um, <clears throat> and then the cash on cash will uh, deviate as well. You know, if a property has great cash flows um, from day one, we'll, we'll accept lower overall returns because we know we're getting a good yield, uh, which is pretty unique in, in our market right now. And, and then conversely, if 
if the property has no cash flows, be it because it has high vacancy or extremely low rents, uh, then we're going to require a higher IRR via the back end appreciation. So that's just kind of the general rule of thumb for the returns. And, and then, you know, people always like to ask about, oh, well, what cap rate are you buying? And uh, what's your return on cost and things like that? And I ha I used to say, well, it's really not that important. We don't really focus on it, but you do, once you've seen enough deals, you really get the rules of thumb. Uh, it doesn't always work, but for example, the, the 1% rule, if you're, if you're buying a property at, let's say, 50,000 uh, 50, per unit, uh, you know, rents should be 1% of that, which would be $500. But in our Texas markets, for example, property taxes are so high, potentially 3%, uh, your expense ratio is higher. And so you need higher rents than the 1% rule typically <clears throat> has. So in, in Texas, we're looking really maybe like a 1.25% rule as a general thumb rule of thumb and however in vegas uh we actually just bought a deal for seventy seven thousand per unit and the rents there are more closer to 550 so and that deal made a whole lot of sense so it just you can't really hang your hat on one rule of thumb but once you kind of see a lot of deals you start to understand oh well if i'm buying at a five and a half cap and i'm creating this much uh increase in rents you know there's there's these rules of thumbs that you can see well the deal starts to make sense of course and uh, obviously you've uh you've done quite a few uh underwriting scenarios by now you said uh 750 um so i think in this market especially we see that the cash flows for year one especially are getting a little tougher to accomplish um at least meeting uh preferential returns for lp investors um so, and it's to a certain extent that cash flow is going to be the cash flow you can't really do too much when you're buying it basically as is. So it's going to be hard to improve that too much year one. Um, to me, to counter that, you need to make sure that your uh, sale price and your basically year five exit, whichever it's going to be, sale or refinance, has to be a little bit more spot on to be able to ensure that you're projecting the right things as far as uh, return for the investors. Um, what are you ensuring that you're doing as far as uh, you know, disposition cap rate, um, et cetera, that you are confident that you are projecting as, um, you know, as detailed as you can for the year five or later exit. Right. Yeah. And so like you mentioned, we do typically, uh, pencil a five year underwriting. So I think five years gives that, that sweet spot of, uh, the underwriting is long enough to kind of get a good picture of a, of a medium term hold, but it's not too long where, uh, your assumptions are really going to compound and potentially hurt you. Uh, for example, I always like to say the idea that, you know, is, I think only potentially the last 10 years that we've experienced in this economy has been the only time in history that rents have gone up 3% or more in 10 consecutive years. And that may not even be true depending on the market. So really, if you see someone underwriting with 3% annual rent growth for 10 years straight, uh, that's a, that's a tough sell. So I think five years is more reasonable and, uh, gives a good picture. So in terms of, uh, exit cap rate or terminal valuation, we don't really do the, you know, 50 or a hundred basis points above the going in cap rate, just because the going in cap rate is idiosyncratic to the deal itself. For example, if we're buying the deal half vacant, that might be a two cap and obviously we're not going to sell it at a three cap. It's probably going to sell at a six and a half or seven cap depending on the market. So that's an extreme example, but nonetheless, a lot of people are out there buying value add deals, which means you're paying based on pro forma, right? Sellers aren't uh, dumb. They're aware of the upside value that they have in their properties if they're selling you a value add deal. So they're not going to sell the property to you at the market cap rate. They'll sell it at a compressed cap rate because you're paying an implied premium for the upside potential. So, and then syndicators make the mistake of taking that compressed cap rate and then uh, going 50 to 100 basis points over and thinking that's a reasonable disposition cap rate. Um, so I think taking it the, the one step further is understanding, okay, well, I'm buying a value add deal, let's say a five cap, and the market is really trading at a five and a half. And, you know, there's ways you can figure that out. Obviously, knowing your market, talking to brokers, 
and uh, looking at research and then collecting your own data. So, but let's just say you're buying at a five cap because there's upside and the market is a five and a half. You should probably go 50 basis points above the five and a half and, and exit project it to exit at, at a six. And this is also dependent on what market you're in. Some markets are more cyclical. Some markets are steady. And I think, you know, it, it's funny how, how things change, but back in 2018 and in, in the middle to late 2018, we were really thinking, number one, we were heading into a recession. And number two, that interest rates were going to march higher and higher. And that led us to underwriting to pretty high exit cap rates and, and really, uh, uh, penalizing our deals. Um, and now with uh, the new Fed speak r- really indicating that rates are going to be cut and, and lower for longer is really what everybody's saying. Um, I feel more comfortable underwriting to only 50 bips over market. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think it's a good insight because like you say, a lot of uh, syndicators are tending to, from what I see at least, just do that 50 to 100 basis points at the acquisition cap rate, which, like you say, there's a lot from, you know, day zero to year five, what's going on and uh, what type of asset you have comparing just the two alone. Um, they're different assets at that point. So, I'm, I mean, the risk is different. So it's a completely different market that you're buying versus where you're selling. So that's awesome. Um, moving on, uh, you mentioned your Las Vegas and you also mentioned your Texas deals um and how the cash flows were basically essentially different because of um what some of your costs were and you talked about taxes um so when you have your different cash flows like that what exactly are you projecting as far as um the year two and year three values um because are you finding that when you're buying that kind of lower cash flow with that 550 versus 75k unit rents, are you finding that you can up that enough to make it worth it? I just want to know where basically the juice is that you're finding in the squeeze. Right. Yeah. So going back to the idea of the 1% rule, not always being accurate. I mean, I think it's it's handy, especially if you look at a lot of deals in the same market, because then you'll start getting an understanding of what that uh, sweet spot really is. And but specifically for the differencing uh, 1% rule between, for example, Vegas with very low property taxes and, and lower expense ratios and, and Texas, which has higher expense ratios, uh, it's all priced into the cap rate. So at the end of the day, even though you might be buying $500 rents for $70,000 per unit, um, if it's a six cap, it's really the same financial asset that you're purchasing as a six cap in Houston which it, you're paying 50 a door for $800 rents. It's, um, you know, it's different numbers, but at the end of the day, you're purchasing the same amount of income and, uh, in general, not, not to say that Houston and Las Vegas have the same cap rates, but just that's how the market kind of prices in the, the discrepancy and difference in, uh, expense ratios. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause a lot of, a lot of people always kind of scream, like, ignore the cap rate, ignore the cap rate, but it does tell a story. You don't want to rely on it necessarily, I think, personally, but you do need to understand what, where that number is coming from just so you can kind of go forward moving moving on with the deal. Um, so you bought the property, a property. Obviously, you've got a lot going on. Uh, moving after year one, as far as operations go, what type of expenses are you assuming? Because a lot of people have trouble with kind of forecasting what exactly, you know, property management is going to look like, that type of thing. Um, a lot of it is based off T3 or T12 data, obviously, but there is obviously some plays that can be made as the operator to kind of, you know, tighten up the ship and increase the NOI for, for the asset. Absolutely. I think, you know, what, whether you're working with third party or vertically integrated, getting your property management company involved on the front end as early as possible is, is very helpful. Um, they're the experts. They're the ones, uh, managing the day to day. And if they can tell you, Hey, look, the property's currently experiencing 60% turnover. We'll bring that down to market and, and, you know, really create some savings. 
um, you know, I think that's the trust and the relationship you have to have with your property manager. And so getting them involved in the front end to actually help with the underwriting and help getting those uh, pro forma expenses pinned down and, and really understand what's driving those expenses uh, can really bring a, a whole lot of certainty to your underwriting. You know, when I don't have that insight or I'm in a market that I don't know as much about, I do heavily rely on the T12, like you said. And I think for the most part, you can't go wrong on a preliminary underwriting basis to look at historical expenses and project that out as your pro forma and then really look at the price per unit or the cost per unit for each of your expenses. Um, you know, and then there's these rules of thumb that I'm sure vary across the country, but, uh, you might be familiar payroll being about 1200, 1250 per unit, uh, depending on the size. And, you know, the list goes on and on for, for those rules of thumbs. I'd say the, the things that you really can't have a, a rule of thumb for is utilities. That's very specific to, uh, a property and the way it's being, uh, you know, charged back for the utilities or what the total utility usage is, depending on the common areas and things like that. So that's something very, uh, T12 reliant, I think. And, uh, other than that, you can just really either go T12 rules of thumb and, and property management. I think that gives you a good indication of where the expenses are at. And then, like I, like I keep saying, you know, getting the property management company to involved in and understanding the deal and getting you that month by month year one or, and, and up to year two, um, pro forma is, is very helpful. Yeah, I think you explained that very nicely. Essentially, when you're lacking data, you can use those T12 numbers and rules of thumb to kind of fill the gaps. But then, obviously, you want to, as best as possible, involve a more knowledgeable party, which in this case is pretty much going to always be the property manager, um, to kind of make sure those numbers are more accurate and where they need to be to accurately project uh, the costs. So when you have um, property management going over that with you do you tend to have the same do you try to have the same relationship with one property management company in the area and then if you do it's always kind of tricky is there's always a remaining property management company and trying to balance um the best way to go about that whether you should use them because they're more knowledgeable on the property i mean i've heard I've heard a lot of people using you know their own pm for every single deal but there is value in having someone that has worked on the property too. So it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a trade off when you move, move hands. Good point. Yeah. I, we're definitely trying to build a, a relationship and <clears throat> have a strong partner in our property management company. And as far as the transition and takeover process, typically when most people, including us are, are buying a deal, we're going to, try to hire the on-site staff first and foremost, because they're the ones that are actually on site and have the most experience uh, with the property and with the tenants. So they are really the ones with all the value. It's the, it's the maintenance guy that's been there for six years and knows all the, you know, funky things that he's constantly needing to repair or just, you know, how to work some of the, the, you know, on-site mechanics. So, those are the guys that really have uh, guys and girls that have all the value and not necessarily the, the management company itself. So when we take over property, we want to hire those people on board them and, and, uh, you know, keep them on at least for, for a little while. And if they don't work out with our culture, then they'll likely leave us or, or we'll have to fire them. But that's, I think that's a good way to kind of, like you said, keep the continuity of the, of the onsite staff and try to make the transition process um, a, a positive and not a, not a negative. Yeah. And I think that's a, a great answer to that question as well, because you're, you're transitioning as smoothly as possible. You can from basically just overhauling the, the entire complex as far as management goes, um, just kind of swooping in and stealing, stealing their, uh, their payroll to try to help out. Cause you, like you said, they're the ones with the experience. So if you can obviously manage a way to get them in your, in your team, that's, that's a great way to accomplish um, you know, retaining the knowledge for the property. Um, so we've set up kind of the acquisition a little bit, and then we talked about um, expenses. Um, as far as more operations go, I wanted to go over what um, the rent increases you kind of talked about already. 
Um, but as far as the premiums that you achieve and what you forecast, um, basically, because there are ways to kind of hit the quick wickets of like, if I put X amount of dollars in, we can, and we generate Y, that's probably going to end up being pretty good. Um, is there kind of, just go over, I guess, your thought process when you kind of basically inject money into each each room, each unit, and then what you expect to get to make it kind of worth your while. Yeah. So for for interior renovations, depending on what you're doing, on you know, typically a heavy turn could cost four thousand dollars. If you're going to go higher end with stainless steel and granite, that could be seven thousand um, dollars. We we typically are buying C class property and not putting a full renovation in. So, you know, when I'm underwriting, I typically put 5,000 per unit as a placeholder for our interior renovations. Could be, uh, could be less, sometimes more, uh, if we're adding washers and dryers, which we love to do that, uh, then it's, that's typically another thousand dollar cost. Uh, but that's well worth the money because pretty much any rent bump that you get, uh, from an interior renovation program, if accepted by the market uh, and gets you a, even a, a modest premium, is, is well worth doing because the let's say even if you only get fifty dollar uh, rent bumps, that's still six hundred dollars increase in in revenue versus a four thousand dollar cost. So you know anybody would make that deal, uh, you know, to get that um, to get that return. Uh, but then that also just increases the value of your property. Uh, but, you know, like you said, we're not really going for $50 rent increases. We really would like at least $100. And uh, I, I think if you can get that $100, that's that's really great. Uh, but also, very importantly, you get the benefit of improving the competitiveness of your property in the submarket. And that that new interior finish is going to last longer. It's potentially going to keep tenants longer and has other benefits than just the rent bump you get. Yeah, that's great. So you men- you mentioned how uh, you try to achieve those premiums. And then what I find is that those premiums, obviously, like you said, the rent does affect uh, the return on the property quite a bit. So even $50, like you said, is definitely not always worth it, but definitely a significant increase to the value of the property if you can achieve that. Um what are you doing specifically to be conservative enough to make sure that you're pricing those premiums correctly? Because A, you have the cash flow improvement, but B, on sale, that evaluation could be sky high if you don't price those premiums correctly and you don't end up achieving those rents that you thought you were going to get. Yeah, that's that's a great point because, like you said, the, the model is extremely sensitive to a handful of inputs. Uh, Rent premiums or pro forma projection, rent projections, um, annual rent increases, and terminal cap rate. So, you know, a slight tweak on any one of those things could increase your IRR by 100, 200, 300 basis points. And all of a sudden, you think you have a great deal in your, in your hand, and it's just a slight tweak of one of those. So, absolutely, I, I think the pro forma rents, you definitely want to undersell and, 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 you know, beat them out. Um, when you actually, you know, from your performer to actual. Um, and I think there's really no, no secret trick. I, I think it's just conservative comp work, um, being able to utilize, uh, the, the data around you in terms of the sub market and what are comparable rents and, and really taking a, a step further and understanding what the all in cost is for tenants in the area, because maybe a property next door has $800 rents, but then the the complex is layering in a $40 washer and dryer fee, a $25 trash fee, and maybe some other some other fees. And all in, they're actually at $900 rents. You know, you wouldn't know that unless you really d- dug in. But understanding that property nearby has $900 rents can actually bode bode better for your in, into your renovations and uh, give you more insight as to where you can price your rent comps. Uh, or your performer rents. But I think I like to look at one mile radius, similar vintage property, understand what 
um, how competitive is the other property in terms of amenities and uh, the interior finish. And that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, you mentioned there at the end the one mile radius. Uh, sometimes that is kind of hard to achieve. Uh, so where do you try to be flexible as far as how far you go out and then uh, how it dissimilar properties? Because you might be in certain you know sub markets of your area, your MSA, and you may not really have a ton of comparables. Which it's not impossible to do, but it makes it makes your your legwork a little bit tougher. Yeah, that's that's interesting. We you know we do typically look at deals that have a lot of comps, uh, but if if they don't, right? In the absence of knowledge, you have to just discount uh, the knowledge that you do have and get create a bigger um, room for error. So yeah, when when comps are further and further out, I just you know there's no calculation, but I just make a mental discount and say, well, it's two miles away and it's getting a thousand bucks or you know a, a dollar ten a foot. You know, maybe we'll do a dollar or a dollar five and just come in under just to be conservative. <clears throat> so I think, you know, like I said, in the absence of knowledge, just try to try to be conservative and, and err on the side of caution. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, oh, going back, going back to the previous point, you're saying how to be conservative and in, in your projections. I think uh, so we I think uh, there's there's two components there that may or may not be explicitly um, explained in, in many people's model um, and understanding of the rent projections, but it's the it's not only where you're taking rents, but how long it's going to take you to get there. So a lot of people say they're going to buy a 200 unit deal and in six months they'll have every unit t- turned and it's a uh, $200 premium and they're good to go. Uh, but that's likely not going to be the case um and so understanding what the natural turn of the property is and what your current occupancy is right because if you have 90 percent occupancy then you have 20 units on a 200 unit deal to to turn at any given moment um but if you're if you're in a sub market that's 96 and and your property is 96 and you want to keep it at 96 while you turn units then that's going to take longer so that's not necessarily a bad thing because you're maintaining higher occupancy, but it's just things to be aware of and, and to price correctly. Uh, so, you know, for us, we explicitly look at <clears throat> uh, the the time it takes for us to get to our pro forma rents. You know, we'll put that in as a stabilization time, like 11 months, 15 months, 20 months. And uh, that's going to slowly push our average rents higher. And during this stabilization time, we have no uh, organic rent growth uh, factored in. So, you know, typically there's a a, a, an annual rent and expense escalator built into models, you know, 3% rent growth, 2% expense growth. And that just happens every year. Uh, We shut that off uh, during our renovation or stabilization timeline. And then once that that 15 month or 20 month period is up and we've hit our pro home rents, now we start growing at our organic growth rate of let's say two, two and a half or three percent. Yeah, that is definitely some good considerations to have because, like you said, if you got two hundred units, you can't, you know, turn them overnight. If there's a GC out there that knows how to do that, get a hold of me and Rob. We would definitely like to talk. Um, and then you spoke about how uh, keeping that vacancy rate low. Um, means you would basically have to, you know, renovate those units slower. And that's definitely a good point as well, because while you're keeping your vacancy costs low, you also aren't getting your premiums as quickly. Um, and then lastly, you spoke about how you did your rental escalation, where you said you froze it, right? Which makes sense. But then just to be clear, what do you do, say, at the month 11? Do you kind of catch up those rates or how exactly do you go about pricing that? Because I know you might not have like the actual, you know, geometric increase for the rents as the months go by, but do you uh, basically catch those market rates back up to where the market is, or do you always have them discounted for life? Yeah. So <clears throat> we just discount them and we underwrite on a month by month uh, pro forma basis. So we, you know, let's say we finish out our renovation program month 11. Well, we'll just start increasing rents 
three percent divided by twelve every month and just slowly uh pick up rents higher. And then during our renovation plan, like you said, the you know, maybe our rent uh growth is fr- frozen, but our certainly our expense growth isn't frozen. So we're still projecting out two or two and a half percent expense growth during that stabilization time. Um, which I think just adds another layer of conservatism that I like into the model. Yeah, it definitely makes you at the end of the day feel good about kind of forecasting what this is all about. And this is really this underwriting, I'm sure you agree, is just a story that you're trying to tell of, you know, the buy, the operation, and the sell. You gotta make sure that, you know, the plot is basically written down the right way so you can confidently say that everything's going going smoothly. Um, Rob, it was a pleasure today. We have a few more questions. We have our uh key questions round. So I'm going to just shoot these off to you and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up after that. So first question, uh, what is an advantage that you had starting out that has helped you succeed? Definitely mentors. Uh, my dad's been in real estate for a very long time on the residential side and, and smaller commercial. And, you know, it was, it was my uh, youth and ambition that got us involved in larger multifamily and bigger commercial projects. And, uh, he had the wisdom to kind of help guide that uh ambition and and passion yeah it definitely helps to have a helping hand to kind of guide you through um that that is incredible incredible advantage to have uh the next question what disadvantage starting out did you have to overcome yeah so similar to my advantage of of youth and ambition um being young makes it really difficult to you know get in a room command a room uh (laughs) get uh, the confidence of investors. So things like that are, are definitely bears, but everybody has to go through them. You know, youth and inexperience, everybody starts there. And I think the, the key to overcoming that is simply partnerships. And so looking to find those mentors, like I said earlier, and, and, and then partners to actually say, okay, well, fine, maybe I don't have the experience, but, you know, here's my partner. He has the experience. And, you know, that's how you can overcome those obstacles. Yeah, that's awesome. You're kind of stealing somebody's resume to to buff up your own. That's great. Um, I I I see the same thing. You know, we're we're a group of younger guys and gals, so it is it is tough to kind of get your foot in the door and earn that respect. Uh, the next one, uh, what is one thing you learned that books, podcasts, or other media did not teach you? So I've got my notes here. So yeah, this is an interesting idea. I think growing up. And, and especially in school and college, you're taught that developing skills and, and being smart and, you know, those are the things that people value the most. And those are the skills that are going to make you successful. And, and that's definitely true. Uh, but really, I think what's not spoken as much about is just personality, um, sales and marketing and, and likability. Those things, I'm, as I'm spending more and more time in the business world, I'm realizing how important that really is. And, um, people really want to, it's so cliche, but people want to work with who they like and who they enjoy working with. And I, I think that's something really big and important that isn't often talked about or something I didn't learn in books as much. And then the second one, which is a little less, um, rosy is, uh, the world is a tough, tough place and business especially is very competitive. And there's, there's some bad people out there. And especially when you put, uh, you know, the business of making money uh, involved, it, it it brings the worst out of bad people. So I think that's something growing up in a very honest and fair and kind household. And I, I really didn't uh, experience that until actually being involved in business and, and going through and, and meeting a lot of people and, and doing deals. And so I think that is something, um, something I, I learned through experience rather than reading. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, yeah, like you said, there are some tough people out there. So having those soft skills, like you said earlier, is uh, is awesome to hone in on and kind of know your relationships uh, moving forward. Uh, the next one, what have you been focusing on lately to improve yourself or your business? So something on the business side is I've really been taking a step back and identifying all of the processes that we do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis uh, and trying to discreetly uh, outline them and uh, optimize them and then delegate them. Um, so one of my favorite funnels of productivity is a ta- if you have a task, can you eliminate it? You can't eliminate it. Okay. Can you automate it? If it can't be automated, can you delegate it to someone else? 
it can't be delegated can you procrastinate it for later and you know and if you've gone through that whole funnel you can you procrastinated it you can just start it at the top again and then keep going through and if and if none of those things work then just sit down and get that thing done uh so i think processes and, and figuring out okay what is really the the core of our business what are we spending the most time doing and, and trying to find ways to actually spend more time on those high value things and um optimizing them and then on the personal side it's pretty similar actually and it's uh something i've recently been doing which is a kpi dashboard and it's really just i'm a i'm a goal fanatic i like to write my goals down every day i like to brainstorm anytime i want to plane i just let my imagination run wild and really brainstorm my goals and and my future and uh bring that da back down to reality you have these big goals but what can you do this week to actually get you, you closer to your goals sure your inbox is full you have a lot of emails you have deals to underwrite you have people to meet and and things to do but what are those things that nobody is telling you to do and there's no due date on them, but they're just the most important things that are going to advance you and your business the most. And I have, I've created a, a weekly and quarterly list of things that I need to get done that, are, um, that I, I find very helpful. Yeah. That's like that adage that, uh, 20% of the task accomplish 80% of your business. Uh, you know, so that's, that's definitely great. I like that little funnel idea. That was definitely a, a nice little if loop to kind of just, you know, get to the root of it, the task is important or not, or what you can do to solve it. Um, and then last, but definitely not least, how can the listener reach you? You can find us at lonestarcapgroup.com. And you can email me directly at rob at lonestarcapgroup.com. Uh, reach out to me if you want a copy of my underwriting model. If you liked what I said today and want to learn more, I'm happy to chat. Yeah, and he mentioned the uh, the model, folks. That is, uh, it's a huge value. I've checked it out myself. It's definitely uh, very insightful, and it's definitely one of the easier to read models I've seen. Um, so it's definitely really cool to check out. I'm sure he would be happy to answer some questions for you if you had any on there. Um, feel free to reach him. I'll definitely include those details in the show notes. Thank you again, Rob. Once again, this has been a pleasure. I had a great time. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. This has been the Making Money in Multifamily podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or would just like to connect, please feel free to check out the show notes for how you can connect or visit longviewacquisitions.com. 